You're listening to the Just Japan Podcast. Everything you want to know about Japan. Hey there, folks, and welcome to episode number 115 of the Just Japan podcast. Everything you want to know about Japan. My name is Kevin O'Shea, and I'm a Canadian who lives and works right here in Japan. That's right, I call Kobe Japan my home, and I've been living here for eight years now. And each and every week, I bring to you a different topic about life in Japan. That's right, this is a podcast about all things Japan. So, this week we're going to be talking to Tom Gates of the Red Dragon Diaries YouTube channel.、Um, this is a guy who's from the United States. He's lived in South Korea, where I used to live. He knows a lot about judo. Now he lives in Japan. And he's written a book to help people who are interested in teaching in Asia. So, this week's episode is all about Tom and the Red Dragon Diaries. <laughs> Hey folks, remember you can always find the Just Japan podcast on iTunes, on SoundCloud, on Stitcher Internet Radio, and on Libsyn, the Libsyn player. And all those links are in the show notes for the Just Japan podcast, episode number 115 at justjapanstuff.com. Justjapanstuff.com, that's where you go to find out all things. About Japan. That's right.、Um, I've written a few blogs recently about nature in Japan. So it's not just the podcast show notes homepage, but there's other things there as well. You can find my Instagram feed,、um, lots of really awesome stuff, the Facebook community feed there, all kinds of cool things. And of course, always lots of awesome links each and every week at justjapanstuff.com. We're sorry, the number you have dialed is not in service at this time. All right, folks, we're in the middle of the dog days of summer. That's right, it's nasty, it's humid. I mean, a lot of mornings when I wake up here in Kobe, Japan, honestly, it's just horrific with the humidity. And when I fire up various weather apps on my phone,、uh, typically when I wake up in the morning, we're talking 95% humidity. It got up to 100% today.、Uh, you know, by mid afternoon, you're maybe down to 70%, 65% humidity. It's pretty wet, sticky, and hot. It's, it's the kind of weather where you definitely have to bring, and most of my coworkers do the same as I do,、uh, normally at least two changes of clothing to work with you. You, you have that, the, the clothes you wear to work, and then you get to work, and then you have a change for the morning, and you're probably going to have to change again in the afternoon. It's a time of year where you use a lot of deodorant and those Gatsby body sheets, preferably ice type. The kind of things we talked about a few episodes ago. When, with regards to dealing with summer in Japan, the dog days of summer.、Um, yeah, so it's really intense. It's nasty.、Um, yes,、yeah, so、it's gross. I don't like it. I don't like it, folks.、Um, aside from that,、uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing well myself.、Uh, I've recently added some tweaks and changes, trying to reinvigorate the Just Japan podcast Patreon campaign. It's something that's been neglected for a long time.、Um, you know, some of you out there are. Participated now, no longer participate. A few of you still do, but there's some more motivation out there now for you folks to go to patreon.com slash just Japan podcast. That's, that's where you can support this podcast. If you like it, if you care about this podcast, if you think it's cool, you can support us monetarily because, you know, hey, it helps a lot.、Um, so there's some incentives now if you go to the link in the show notes or if you just go to patreon.com slash just Japan podcast or again, Go to justjapanstuff.com, look at the link.、Um, yeah, so you can get yourself uh, uh, bonus episodes.、Uh, you know, there's, there's a fee, kind of an entry level fee, where you can get yourself one bonus episode of the podcast a month only for patrons or patrons, a mini episode.、Um, there's another fee where you can get yourself two bonus、uh, episodes a month, mini episodes. You can get yourself、uh, mentioned in the show.、Uh, you can get yourself, if you've got like a website or a business or something you want to kind of like pimp out. Yeah, essentially like advertising.、Um, you can get, I, hey, I'll do that for you.、Uh, 
um, if it's appropriate and it fits, um, I will mention your thing, your social media thing, your website, whatever it may be. And, um, you know, hey, if, if, if you're willing to, to donate to a certain level, why not come on the show as a guest? That's a possibility. So uh, check out the new f- the new incentives over at patreon.com slash podcast. Uh, support the show. You love the show. There's a ton of you guys out there who love this show. Um, it would help a lot to make the show better, to make just everything better on my end. Uh, my neck of the woods. Dare to dream I could someday be a podcaster, uh, you know, as a full-time job. Wouldn't I love that? Um, that would probably involve me probably branching out to doing some other podcasts and doing some things, uh, you know, different topics, different things, different genres. Um, but well, would, wouldn't that be fun? Um, but with your support, I don't know. Well, we, we can at least take care of our server costs. We're not there anymore. <laughs> We're not there anymore. So a uh, few guys jump on board and we can take care of that stuff. But again, we got some cool incentives. And I'm definitely um, up for making some uh, bonus material for you folks out there who are willing to contribute to Patreon. Some bonus episodes of the podcast for only patrons. Hey, I'm game with that. I'm down with it. Let's do it. All right. Check the show notes. All right, folks, I'm really excited to talk to Tom Gates this week, the guest on the Just Japan podcast. He's been in Japan for not that long. He's been in Asia for several years, most of his time in Korea, where he has an, he has an awesome YouTube channel called The Red Dragon Diaries, um, and I've followed him for several years. And uh, the man knows a lot of stuff about judo, which I think is really cool, because I did judo for a short time in high school, once upon a time. And also, um, you know, my 20s and early 30s, I was a big practitioner of martial arts. Um, I was a boxer in high school for a while, too. And I spent a lot of time doing Taekwondo when I lived in Korea. Um, I don't I don't practice martial arts right now, but maybe in the future it would be something I could do. I really have a passion. I had a passion for it. Really loved it. Loved the discipline. Loved the training. Loved how it made me a, a physically stronger, a mentally stronger person. Um, so, uh, you know, Tom's got this amazing YouTube channel with a lot of great, great videos about, you know, life in Korea, martial arts, life in Japan now. So I want to have him come on the show and talk about all of that cool stuff. And also, he's recently written a book that's available for, for sale, uh, you know, about teaching English in Asia. And I want you guys to have a chance to to hear about that. I mean, many years ago, I wrote a book about the same kind of thing. But my book is dated. It's I mean, that's six years ago I wrote that thing. And, uh, you know, uh, time change, times change, knowledge changes. And Tom's got some really great up-to-date current knowledge about this. So I really want for you folks out there who are interested in teaching in Asia to, um, you know, to take a listen to this podcast because, um, you know, you're going to hear more about his book. But also for all of you out there who are interested in, in just life in Korea, life in Japan, you're interested in judo, you're going to find this a cool interview. So sit back and listen. Um, all right, folks out there, it is Just Japan Podcast, episode number 115, Red Dragon Diaries. And uh, we've got a special guest this week, and that is Tom Gates. Tom, thank you so much for joining us. Hello, and thank you very much. It's, Thanks for it's, having me on here. Yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure. I've been watching your videos for years on YouTube, and uh, finally have a chance to to get to chat with you. So I'm I'm really looking forward to this. Um, yeah, so, so to begin with, um, could you tell the Just Japan podcast listeners a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and what you do here in Japan? Well, uh, let's see here. <clears throat> I was born and raised in New Hampshire, which is the far, far up north, northeastern part of the United States. And uh, <clears throat> New Hampshire is pretty rural in general, but uh, I'm from... A very small town and a lot of people say oh I'm from a small town but high school just to give you a uh, perspective was comprised of I think five neighboring towns and my graduating class had 60 students oh wow that's oh wow that's that's yeah small. it was small I'm actually a small town boy myself I'm from uh, Nova Scotia not that far away um, oh, wow. and uh, I grew up in a little fishing village of about a thousand people and we had a county high school um, but we had we had people shipped in from probably about I don't know twenty areas, <laughs> so oh, wow. it, it was it was uh, yeah definitely more than sixty people, 
Wow. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So small town. And uh, went to school there, went to the University in, of New Hampshire. And then um, <clears throat> because it's freezing cold up there during the winters and everything, uh, <laughs> I, I moved to Florida I, I, for a short time. And then uh, I lived in New York City. I moved back up north for work. And that's when I was in IT and stuff like that. Oh, okay. Yeah, New York City. So you were involved in the IT industry. What did you do in that? Well, uh, it was software development, and I'm not an engineer. I don't. I'm not a programmer or anything like that. <clears throat> I got involved on the administrative side uh, because, if you remember the whole Y2K shenanigan. Yes, yes. So that that whole thing created a massive number of jobs, um, and I was able to get my career started because of that. And I started learning the ropes and whatnot. And, uh, so I was a, I wrote specs and I moved into more specific project management for um, IT and more specifically like uh, software development. Okay, cool, cool, cool. No, I'm, I'm interested when I hear that because I was involved, believe it or not, I was involved in uh, software development right around the same time as you were. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was, uh, and, and those of you who are, you know, loyal listeners will know. Um, I used to be a three D three D modeler at a game design company um, around like the late nineties into the early two thousands before I went to Korea. No kidding. Yeah, small world. Oh, so you have like a creative streak then? Anyway. I suppose so. Yeah, yeah. Three D three D graphics was something I was really into. Not an animator. Not an animator. I'll clearly tell that everyone. Not an animator. <laughs> I have no idea how to make things move. Um, but and and I was not a not a character modeler either. I just I, I made stuff. Oh, okay. Games. But yeah, it was it was a wonderful thing. But um, yeah, okay, cool. So so you're in New York, you're doing that kind of thing. And then I moved back to Florida, um, and that it, let's see here in 2005, <clears throat> and that's where I was up until I I went to Korea. All right, so there we go. You were in Korea, so you're yes. in Japan now, and we'll talk a bit more about that. But uh, I'm you know I'm curious about your path that led you here. So you lived in South Korea. Yes. So can you tell us a little bit about what? What led you to, to South Korea and, and what you did there? Well, in a nutshell, uh, around 2008, 2009 is when the whole meltdown of the economy happened with the banking subprime mortgage fiasco there. Yeah. And <clears throat> uh, I was one of the fortunate people to get laid off <laughs> from my job at the time. Um, and I, that was like around the end of 2008. So for the following couple of years, it was a mishmash of going to the other side of Florida, um, <clears throat> heading back up to New Jersey, New York to try and grab contracts and just kind of keep things going. Mm -hmm. But all during that time, I had been looking into uh, teaching English because I was thinking to myself, I, I had kind of be a little become a little disenchanted with, with IT. I'd been doing it for 13 years. So I said, you know, Maybe I just need to get away for a little while and then, you know, teaching English in Korea. Maybe that would be a good option just to kind of shake the rust off a little bit and just see where, you know, see where I'm at. Hmm. So throughout going back and forth, up and down, all over the East Coast, I was <clears throat> looking into it and um, getting my documents together, talking to recruiters, watching videos. And that's your video, I think, is has to be, if not the first, one of the first videos, the one where... You're sitting in like a dark room with a baseball cap on. Oh God, that was one I made in Canada um, after I'd <laughs> left Korea because I left Korea. Um, and I, like, in my time in Korea teaching, I taught there for five years and I, I, I said to myself, I really love teaching. So I'm going to go back to Canada and become a air quotes real teacher. Um, so I went back to university and I, I got my teaching degree and I made that video while I was in university in Canada getting my teaching degree. Yeah, yeah. the uh, that was like one of my – that was my first – Viral videos. I yeah, it was, it was and, and at the popular. time it was viral. It got like fifty thousand hits, which <laughs> in two thousand and seven was like mad. That's big time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, back then, the people don't understand now, and <clears throat> it surprises me just how quickly time has gone by. But back in two thousand nine, two thousand ten, there was only like, I mean, regulars, maybe like four or five. I don't know if you remember Durkey in Korea. Yeah, Mike Durkey. There was uh, Mike Durkey. Yeah, I'm still friends with Mike Durkey. Uh, oh, no well, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he 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 still vlogs, um, and he uh, follow him on Instagram. Um, and there was Mike Durkey and then uh, Mike Arnold, mm. who was like the epic exploring the streets of Seoul. 
Yeah. You know, epic guy. Um, yeah, but yeah there, well, there, there weren't many, huh? There weren't too many. I mean, you know, if you if you wanted to – back then it's, uh, oh, I want to see what a Korean apartment looks like. There were like 10 videos. Well, one of them was mine. And one of them was yours. And I think you had a couple when you had moved around and stuff. Yeah, and yeah. Now, you know, you can't even – it's an ocean of videos. Mm -hmm. But um, so I ended up landing a permanent really good job uh, in Miami. I Sometimes I look back and say – Boy, that was a pretty good gig. But uh, um, I ended up saying, look, you, you're a little bit, you're disenchanted with this. I mean, you can always go back to it. So I had uh, received the call back that, you know, I was going to go to Epic. And I said, you know what, just go, just go. So I quit that job and I ended up going to Busan with Epic, which what is... is, what, uh, what, is that? what is Epic? Yeah. So Epic is the English program in Korea and that's the public school's uh, English program, uh, basically what it is, it's as assistant teaching to the Korean co-teacher. And, um, you know, you help teach classes, you model authentic speech and, um, you know, you do a lot of games and activities and things like that. It's a great gig. It's, it's a nice way to see Korea. It's low stress. It should be low stress. Um, would that be kind of, would it be, relatively accurate for me to compare it, make a comparison, say that's kind of the Korean equivalent of the JET program? I think they're, I, I think they're pretty much the same, yeah. Yeah. So, yep. okay, so you're there with the EPIC program, and um, you, were you, you were in Busan your whole time? Yeah, I was in Busan for four and a half years. I was with EPIC. Um, <clears throat> we got extended just to bring everyone to the same time frame, so that's where that four and a half years comes. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, I had just kind of reached a point after four and a half years where I thought, you know, I think Epic is a good good way to start. I, I had decided to let IT kind of fall by the wayside. So I was approaching teaching a little bit more seriously. And I said, you know, it, it is a gr I'm so comfortable now. It's almost a bad thing. So I think it's time to kick things up a notch and, and I guess spread my wings and, and move on. And that's that's what I did. Nice, nice. And we're going to get into that because you're, you're here in Japan now. But what I'm curious about, I mean, you know, um, watching your, your YouTube channel, The Red Dragon Diaries, I mean, you, you do talk about a lot of different things. you got like food videos, travel videos. You talk about teaching a lot. You give a lot of great advice. But um, obviously a, a theme that comes up uh, in your videos that is clearly something you're passionate about is judo. Yeah. So judo is a big part of your life. Can you tell us uh, about kind of your... Your judo experience, your judo journey. Where, yeah. Where, where did that begin? Well, I've always been in martial arts. My uh, foundationally, I guess you would say, from my from my young days, what I, my background is actually like in uh, punching, kicking styles like karate and taekwondo and full contact kickboxing and stuff like that. Oh, okay. But then I went to college, and it was there that they had a judo club. And so I joined that, and I really fell in love with it, and I just kept doing it, and it's and it's been with me the whole time. Nice, nice. Yeah. No, I'm I'm totally interested in that because like when I was um when I was a kid uh, growing up in, in Canada, I had I had an opportunity to do a little bit of taekwondo, and then in high school I did judo, and I was in a boxing club as well. Oh. And then when I went to Korea, uh, before I lived in Busan, I lived in uh, a place called Ilsan in in uh, Gyeonggi-do, and mm -hmm. then and then I lived in Seoul proper, like downtown in Seoul. Um, near uh, in Shincheon, near Yonsei University. But oh. when I lived in Ilsan, I actually started training in Taekwondo. And it was just, to be honest, of my five and a half years in Korea, that's my best experience. Was uh, It was like a year and a half where I trained five nights a week. Wow. And uh, we trained, I trained every night after work. I finished work at 7.30. I would have class at 8. And I trained, it was an hour class, but the master would let me sometimes stay a bit later and train. And then eventually when I built a good rapport with him, um, basically I became like a recruiter and I got him so many foreign students. I, w I was one of those first and then I got him about 20 foreign students um, wow. that, that he was like, you don't have to pay me any money anymore. <laughs> nice. He was like, like, don't, don't worry about this. And then he was like, you know, like if you, you got breaks in the afternoon and stuff like break time between classes. The, the, his dojong was like right across the road from my, my hogwan. He was like, just come on over and train. Jeez. So I could like just like uh, if I had a, a, a an hour break or a two hour break, I'd just run across the road and put on my uh, I think uh, if I remember the term dobok, 
Yep. And yep. then and then I just start kicking that. I just start kicking the heavy bags, and uh, you know, do some training for a while, and then I'd change and run back to work, and then come back after school and do my class, and uh, loved it. Wow, you were serious. I had no idea you were so involved. I had no idea you were involved in uh, Taekwondo. But yeah, yeah. Taekwondo was a huge part of my life, actually, my wow. first few years in Korea. And um, I got to Red Belt, and um, my masters were always pushing me to go to, oh, God, uh, Cookie One, I think they call it, in, in, mm -hmm. in uh, Gangnam to get my black belt. But I never felt that I was ready. Mm. Because um, I know that in Judo, for example, in Japan, uh, from experience with friends of mine who, who, who do judo, that it's kind of a very judo and take, I, I guess, how shall I say? Um, sometimes martial arts in, in Asia can have a very different perspective with belts than in Western culture. Mm. Like I, I, I think that like with Taekwondo in Korea, the black belt is a beginning. You can get your black belt actually relatively quickly. Right. And then your martial arts journey kind of begins mm -hmm. and you, you head towards becoming a master. Whereas in often in, in Canada and America, it takes many, many, many years to get your black belt. Mm. And getting that black belt is kind of a sign of a, a level of mastery. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I was a red belt in Taekwondo in, in, in Korea. And I was pretty adept in my class. But then I remember some uh, a, new, a new guy in town came, a guy from the States, who was a red belt in America. And, oh, my God, he was so much better than me. <laughs> oh really like yeah just like the precision of his kicks were just wow. so much sharper and and then it was just kind of like oh wow oh, oh. i'm wearing the same belt but he's at a definitely much higher level and right. he'd been doing taekwondo he said for like 10 years and wow. I'd, I'd only been doing it for a year and i was at this like the same belt level hmm. um but you know my master had told me that once you get your black belt then you start learning Interesting. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, at least in Taekwondo, it's like once you have the black belt, then you start learning. Um, yeah. Yeah. But... I, th I think it's pretty similar. You know, I think uh, <clears throat> I, th I think the black belt kind of just represents um, a general but firm understanding of, I guess you would call it the curriculum of the art, which means you you have you you can demonstrate things. You don't you're not you know you're not going to the Olympics or anything like that, but you 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 understand the techniques. You can demonstrate them to your level of athleticism or whatever it is. You know you've put in a relative time and grade, and you know so there's your black belt. And like you said, I, if you really want to get good, then there's all these different venues to get really good, which I think are are missing not I think they're you know they're missing in America and stuff like that but um, the black belt is really just I th and like you said I, I think it kind of throws people off because they're like wow they give the black belt so simple and blah 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 and yes you know it's I, I think it's just showing that you understand that you're grasping the curriculum up to that shodan or chodan in Korea and um, then they have all these different ways that you can really attain mastery or high level competitive skills and things like that. Yeah, well I mean what I I'm just kind of having flashbacks to my time training. And one of the one of the reasons why I and and actually I want to bring this into some of the videos you've you've done about training about about judo in in, in Korea. Um but I mean I actually became disillusioned because of the hogwanization hogwanization of mm -hmm. of, of the martial art where I was. Um you know, obviously a hagwon would be the same as an eikaiwa in Japan, like a language school or this mm -hmm. or that. And as a business model, you don't want to lose students. You want to keep them. So even if often in, in English schools, even if they're not, if they haven't achieved the level they need to move on to the next level, you fear that the, you're going to lose their tuition money, mm. even if they're not ready to move on to the next level. So in order to keep that th their tuition money coming in, you still move them on, even <laughs> if even if it's not, if they're not ready. And I saw that. I mean, I didn't train. I was. I mean, I wasn't hardcore in Taekwondo. I mean, I was just training. Like you know, it was, it was, it was a hobby. Right. Um, you know, no no aspirations of becoming competitive because I didn't start doing it until I was like twenty six. Mm. Um, but uh, you know, I I remember ta I took it extremely seriously, 
and I really loved it. And I would I would train several times a day, and then I'd wake up in the morning, and I would like, first thing in the morning I'd wake up and I'd, I'd I'd stretch for you know twenty minutes, half an hour. I'd go to school and work, and then I'd train in the afternoon, and then I'd go to class at night, and then when I when I'd go home, I'd practice my my pumses, my forms in front of a big mirror, and I really took it seriously. And then I would I would go when we'd have a belt test. I would do my test, and then I would watch other people come up and do the test, and they would make so many mistakes, 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 mistakes. And then, like the next Monday, we'd come in and we'd they'd get the same belt that I would. They would all <laughs> yeah. they would all be promoted. And I'd be like, but <laughs> but no, they made so many mistakes. I worked so hard. They clearly didn't. Right. And I got so pissed off yeah. that eventually I just stopped training. Yeah, yeah. And, and but so so there's that kind of level. But I mean, um. You know, I saw some videos that you put up in Busan where you went to some special schools. Mm -mm. And that just looks so hardcore. Like the special, yeah. like the elementary school, junior high school, high school kind of, you know, you made you made a couple of videos where it went right up to the university system. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, you know, that's the great divide right there. You know, there's local, there's local club play and that's mostly like, <clears throat> you know, for fun and camaraderie and stuff like that. And you know you can get a you can get a black belt and you know in a couple of years or something like that and you know be on with it. I think it's just kind of part of a uh, it's just something you do, you know. And I think that's how most people practice you know practice martial arts in the world. Probably it's it's that kind of thing. Yeah, it's a hobby. Yeah, as a hobby, and you know make you feel good and give you some confidence and stuff. Mm -hmm. But you know the the difference between a, a Korea or Japan and so many other countries, not just America, but so many other countries is, you know, it's rooted in the culture, you know, Japan, it's their style and Korea and Japan have so many similarities culturally. Um, so the system, uh, if you want to get on a track to really get good, they're, they're similar. And the best way to do that is to have it in the schools and they have it uh, way early on in, mid in elementary schools, the middle school, you know, they go at all girl middle schools that have judo teams. Um, so, um, the, that was the whole element that I, that I was like, you know what, I, that's what I think a lot of people want to see. And I would like to, to see that too. And so I just snooped around and I was, I had made a lot of friends and a lot of connections, um, in judo. So, but that's, that's the big thing. And if you're from America, you just don't probably Canada too. You just, you don't have that option. You can be so passionate about it, but you're like, oh man, the one guy that went to the Olympics in 1976 or whatever, 1980s, he's on the other side of the country. I can't go train with him, you know? So, mm. whereas in a, I mean, Korea is a teeny tiny country, South Korea is, but they've got, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of Olympic gold medalists and world champions just floating around and, you know, you can just cross paths with them and jump on the mat with people that are training five, six days a week, you know, doing Rondori at high level with, with other guys, you know, like at a university or something. So mm. that whole element is, is missing. So if you're a kid and for some reason you get bitten by the judo bug or the karate bug or kendo bug, uh, same in Korea. In Korea, the big three are judo. They call it Yudo, Kendo, they call it Gumdo, and mm, Taekwondo. Right. Yeah, those are the three big ones. Yeah, yeah, that's right, Gumdo, that's right. And uh, if you want to be good at it, <clears throat> you can be really good at it. I mean, Gumdo is like way more popular than Judo in Korea. I would mm -hmm. say gum, Gumdo is, is easily the second most popular martial art in Korea behind Taekwondo. Easily. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Taekwondo rules, right? It's, that yeah. is definitely number one. Um, judo was almost seemed kind of underground mm. to me. Like, I mean, I had what, like when I lived in, uh, Gyeonggi-do in Ilsan, I had one friend, uh, I knew an American guy who was a wrestler and he, he wrestled in university in the States. Mm. So he, he found a judo club and I remember they actually, like, I think he was like a varsity wrestler in, in university. So, um, in a pretty big school. So he, he joined Judy. He'd never done Judy before, but like I think like after like a month, they're like, "Here's your black belt." <laughs> oh, really? Um, or or not a black belt, but uh, I don't know. It was it was kind of like a, you know it was it it was a kind of a hogwan system. So they gave him like a high colored belt. Whereas oh. whereas and I know here in Japan, 
Um, I know, for example, when it comes to judo, you're a white or you're a black. Mm, right. Um, in karate, too. Um, I, I think, no, maybe not karate. Well, maybe, actually, for children, it's different. For children, they give them colors to motivate them. But mm, right. as an adult, I know in judo, white and black, right? White, brown, black. White, brown, black. Okay, because yeah. I, I, I've got some friends who've trained in this area who went from white to black. But like you said, I think it depends. And they were, they were white belt for a really long time. Yeah. I think it depends because, you know, the more <laughs> the more colors you have, the more tests and you can, you know, can charge for that and stuff. So. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, uh, I'm, I'm curious. How did you, how did you get into... Um, how did you get into judo when you like i mean obviously okay you're doing it in america but right. it, this is an interesting thing i mean like uh, for people who who you know are practitioners of martial arts in their own country and they come to korea or they come to japan um you know you come here you don't speak the language mm. you don't know anybody i, I mean I, i'm gonna be really honest the way i got into taekwondo was completely accidental it was like literally one of my coworkers was like hey i found this like flyer outside <laughs> and it was it was all in Korean. Yeah. And at the very bottom, flyer. at the very very bottom of the flyer in English, it just said "foreigners welcome" <laughs> in English, like two words. Yeah. And yeah. we were like, "Huh?" So that intrigued us. And she was like, "Would anyone be interested?" And there was myself and like two other people. Like, yeah. And we went over and we inquired. And actually, our the our Taekwondo master, um, he had just moved back from L.A. He was like Korean American. <laughs> And he, oh. he had been like a professional bodyguard and this and that. And he had, he had, and he, uh, yeah. So, I mean, like he spoke completely fluent English. Oh, funny. But it was just, but the reason we, we literally found it by chance. Yeah, really. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if, if you're a judo practitioner and you're, you know, you're in America, Canada, Australia, wherever it may be, and you're coming to, say, Japan or Korea, um, what's some advice you'd find, you know, you'd throw to people for like, how do you get started doing it? Well, like you said, judo is kind of, it feels underground because it's such a rough style. It's not, it really isn't for everybody. Uh, they call it the, the gentle way, but there's nothing gentle about it. You know, there's many injuries. It's, it's grappling, it's throwing and stuff like that. So there's way, far less schools and stuff like that. So I would say for the average person, the best way to do it, the very best way is to go wherever you're working and ask a Korean to go onto a site called Naver, N-A-V-E-R, which is like kind of like a Google-ish type thing. And it, if you type in like judo, they'll type something in and it'll bring up all the schools in that area. And then you can just go go visit there. Okay. The way I found mine, and and I'll be honest, I you know, the the old man there that you've seen in the videos, I oh, mean yes. I, I don't know how long I'll be <clears throat> teaching abroad or doing whatever I do or even doing judo, this situation that I, that I came into with this old man. Tell, tell us about this old man because those videos are amazing. It, it, the, Especially the story, with like the, the soju bottle stuff he does yeah. and the push-ups and oh my God. This, this, this podcast could be about him. I mean that's yeah. how broad this story stretches and it's so – you can't pen something like this. Um, I'm on a, <clears throat> if you remember Busan, I, w I lived in Yongdo. Yongdo was the island right out, right over the bridge from, uh, Nampodong. Oh, okay. 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 I lived, I lived like in the hub. I guess I lived in Hyundaegu and Jung, uh, okay. Jung, gosh, I'm forgetting Jungnam, I want to say. Wang Gwangali? No, 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 not uh, actually, uh, pa Jungsan. Oh, okay. Like, like, right, past right, right, Hande right. by Dalmaji, like, right, like, uh, where all the tourists go. Yes, yes. Yes. Well, if you know Nampodong, right yep. across, and um, Jagalchi Fish Market, mm -hmm. if you're if you're out on the water in Jagalchi, you will look at Yongdo. It's this island. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's separated, you know. So and uh, everyone kept telling me when I first moved there, oh, it's a lower income area and stuff like this and blah 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 blah. And it's just it's just kind of out there. Well. I had gone food shopping, grocery shopping, the f my first time or second time being in Korea. I mean, I'm brand new there, like a month. But I had, <laughs> I had um, taken out these Pimsleur Korean CDs from a local library back home before I left. So two or three phrases. So I take a cab home with all my groceries, and we come up to this 
main intersection and my my apartment is right very you know very close by and I'm so I'm like all right Yudo Jang Odao you know where is there a judo school to the cab driver because I'm like if anyone knows the the lay of the land it's going to be a cabbie yeah and he just points right up straight up at a building and he goes right there it was just like that boom it's right there I was like oh okay I look up and there's like kind of these old pictures like outlined pictures of uh, judo, you know, guys up there, yeah. like cartoon things. So I go up there, and that was it. I mean, this is a story about. It, it's like the. I always tell people, it's like when you go to a movie, and there's the kid from, you know, Canada or America, and he's like, I want to be, I want to go to such and such a land and learn with the master that sits atop the mountain, who nobody knows, and he's just like. He no, everyone's forgotten about him, but he's this gem of massive talent and whatever. That's this that that is this story, because mm-hmm. Yongdo is separated from Busan. I actually, you know, I just brought up. I just had to bring up uh, Google <clears throat> Maps to refresh myself. I'm like, ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah yeah okay. I've never been there. Yep, there's uh yeah, you you have to perp the, you either there's a university out there, Christian university, you either go for that or it's it's actually built up a lot since you've left, but um <clears throat> even so, you have to go out of your way to go out there. Yeah. So it's kind of like a self-contained uh community whatnot. Mm. So here's a guy. Now, this judo dojo was founded in Japan in 1944. Okay. So, and then in 1945, independence happened, and they took the school called Kuksagwan, and they moved it to Busan, and that's this school. Mm-hmm. And there, was, there were two owners prior to this guy, but he's been there for 30, 40 years. He's been the owner of the school. Mm-hmm. And, you, you know, from there, you, you've, seen the, you've seen the pictures. The way it all started was um, there's yeah. a class... And by Go the ahead. way, guys, I'm going to put videos in the show notes. Uh, you go to sh- uh, Just Japan Podcast. Or, sorry, Just J- I keep, why, why do I say that? JustJapanStuff.com. <laughs> and uh, there, there will be video links to the videos about this guy. You'll see him and you'll get what we're talking about. Yeah. But so yeah, yeah. Sorry, continue. So I, I, I go up. And then these days, I had bought this Cisco Flip right before I left for Korea. Because I'm like, I want to take a few pictures. So I bought this Cisco Flip. It was discontinued, so it was like 60 bucks. I'm like, ah, oh, perfect. You just press the button and it's on. So I go up to this school. He doesn't speak a lick of English. And, you know, he's got that raspy, growly voice. And he's just like, he comes up and he says something to me. And then one of the kids happened to speak English. And he says, what are you doing here? Why do you want to do judo? That's what he asked me. Mm. So, you know. We were talking, I explained to them, you know, that I was experienced and whatnot. There's a class at six. It goes from six to seven. Then from seven to eight is off. And then eight to nine is a class. During that in-between time, he goes in his back room and kind of watches TV. He eats dinner and then comes out for the second class. Sometimes he'll go and he'll sleep. Well, this video, Strength of a Korean Judo Master, was when he had just woken up from a nap and Prior to that, I would watch him doing these exercises with the kids on, you know, he would challenge them, you know, because he's 64 at the time. He's pushing 70, you know, he's pushing 70 now. But And I'm like, wait a minute. And I'm watching him do these exercises. And I'm like, I know enough to know that, that those, that's not normal. <laughs> right? So I'm like, all right, can, can I take a picture of, of you doing these things? And uh, <clears throat> he said, yeah, fine. So the next time I came in, I brought my camera. He woke up from a nap, walked straight on the mat, took his shirt off, and that's the video. He, had, he was face all like wrinkled from laying down on it. He, he was completely, he had just woken up. When you turn on that video, maybe earlier, he just rolled off the thing. He's 64 years old. So, so he jumps, jumps on there, and, he, and, he, and I take this video on my little Cisco flip. But I had just arrived in Korea, so I was, you know, still brand new. So I took the thing and I threw it in my bag for like a month or two. It was just sitting there. So one day 
I was bored and I said, you know what, let me learn how to make a video here. So I used this Microsoft uh, Windows Movie Maker. Oh, and yes. I made... That was my first editing suite as well. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I'm like, all right, let me see how you do this. And so I did it and I threw it up and then the, th the thing went crazy. Well, the story in it, I mean, the story right there is, is amazing. I mean, this is a, an amazing guy. <clears throat> so what But what happened later on was I got a call while I was at my school at lunchtime from a, tele, from a cable television station up in Seoul. Okay. And they're like, um, are you the guy that shot this video? Because we want to get in touch with your Guangzhou Nim there. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and basically it was one of those variety shows where they look for these like amateur videos that are kind of like inspiring stories around Korea and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was one of them and they shipped him up to Seoul for a day or so and they put him on national TV and he was on there. Do, they were talking to him about his history and all that kind of stuff. Amazing, amazing story. Oh, cool. That's awesome. Yeah, it was really cool. Nice, nice. Yeah. Um, okay. So, wow. Yeah, that's very cool, guys. I'm gonna put links in the show notes to the these videos. Will be in the show notes at justjapanstuff.com. Um, okay. So, um, okay. You've got a YouTube channel. We've obviously we've already kind of established that. But I mean, your your videos aren't just about judo. Um, so I mean, actually, your you know your YouTube channel. I was just checking. You've got like thirty four thousand plus view. Uh, you know, subscribers, mm. and you, so what kind of inspired you to start a YouTube channel and can you tell us tell us about the Red Dragon Diaries? What what types of videos do you have in your channel? Well, it's um the types of stuff that I cover are teaching mainly teaching related um judo related mainly because of the 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 um Guanjang Nim there. Mm -hmm. Um I had a lot of material. Um some food and travel whenever I go on vacation or something like that. So, and then, you know, I, I would, I'll do maybe some random, um, you know, commentary on some topic or whatnot. And, and that's basically the gist of it. Cool. Cool. And you were doing for a while. I remember you were doing some videos with friend of the just Japan podcast, Steve Miller, yeah. now a voice of America, voice of America reporter. Yeah. Steve yeah. Miller, Stephen Miller. Um, uh, you were doing some fun videos with, uh, Kind of Seoul and Busan, talking about your different perspectives on different topics. Yep, yep. That we were kind of, cool. you know, doing, we would choose a topic and then we would uh, uh, kind of talk to each other, you know, give our opinion to each other through our own video and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, those were cool. Yeah. Um, all right, so, you know, you're, you're, you know, you've lived, you lived four plus years in Korea, but you're not in Korea anymore. No. So where are you? Now, now I am in Hiroshima, Japan, and um, you know I I was you know four and a half years in Busan. It was a great, great experience. I I honestly never thought I was going to be doing staying abroad that long, um, but I knew it was time to move on. I said, you know, it, it's it's kind of, maybe it's a little unhealthy for me. I think now because the job was just really getting a little too unchallenging at the time, and I said, you know, I. Now I'm not really, you know, the newness is worn off. I'm not noticing, you know, the, the stuff anymore. And maybe it's just, maybe it's time for me to move on. And it, it, it really was. So I was actually eyeballing um, Southeast Asia. So okay. mainly Vietnam. And I had uh, received a couple offers. One was, ironically, one was with a Korean international school. So I was going to go to another country to teach Korean kids again. <laughs> Yeah. Teach Korean kids English in Vietnam. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so, uh, and a couple others, the Montessori school in, in, in central Vietnam. And then, so I had all my documents um, verified or, or whatnot, and I was ready to go. And just by, it was just a random thing. I just jumped on, what do you call it, Dave's ESL one night. And I saw this posting and there had always been a part of me that wanted to go to Japan, but it's really tough to get into Japan because most of them say must be in Japan or you must you, have, you a already have to have a visa. Yeah. And if not, 
then you got to go really rural. But then if you go rural, you need a driver's license. And my driver's license expired when I was in Korea. I let it slip. And, and so I was kind of, my hands were tied. Mm. So, but this one was in Hiroshima and um, I contacted them and then boom, boom, boom. Um, it's, uh, things came together and I had a complete shift. And so now I'm with a private elementary school here okay. in Hiroshima. Nice. Yeah. And how long have you been in Japan now? Uh, about four months. About oh, four months. Nice. Yep, so I'm still brand new here. So how are, how are you liking it? Well, Hiroshima is a really nice town. It's, um, I think it's 1.1 million. It's, it's got areas that give it a nice city feel, but at the same time, it's, it's low key enough where you're not like, it's where it's not too much. And I think for me, um, with just, you know, my, you know, at my age and with what, what interests me and stuff like that, I think it's a better situation for me. I think it's a good situation for me. Um, and uh, the school, it's, uh, you know, it's part of a, like a conglomerate of schools, I guess you would say, in the okay. city here. It's a, a company that owns uh, two universities, two high schools, a middle school, and this elementary school. Oh, okay. So it's a pretty big outfit. And cool. um, yeah, it's a pretty good, uh, it's, a, it's a nice town here. I like it. Nice, nice. Yeah, I, I've only been to Hiroshima once, and that was in... Uh, I guess I guess 2008 when I first arrived here, just a few months after, mm. um, and it, it, it's it's quite an impactful place. It's quite meaningful, like when you go to places like the Peace Park and whatnot. Yeah, you know you have that side, but then you also have the the wonderful things like Hiroshimiyaki, Hiroshima style okonomiyaki. Love that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So okay, hey, you have written a book, good sir. Yes, you've written a book, and um, that's what, what caught my attention. Recently, I saw a video of yours, and I'm like, "Hey, this guy wrote a book. Tom yep. wrote a book." And I've I've been watching your videos um, on and off for years, and uh, you know, especially when I see that someone else, when when someone out there has has gone through the process of writing a book, I, I've actually had several authors on this podcast in the past. Um, you know, and once upon a time, many years ago, I wrote a book about teaching in Korea and Japan um, six years ago. It's all very dated stuff now. I would even mention what it was called. Um, but, okay. <laughs> but, but I mean, you know, I, I'm familiar with the writing process and it was, you know, it was, it was an amazing challenge for me and it was really, and it was a really uh, incredible thing to do it and get it out there. Um, but yeah, so you've written a, a book um, that is a, a resource for those out there who are interested in teaching in, in Korea. Could you yeah. tell us a little bit more, or could you tell us about it? Yeah. Well, the name of it is Destiny Nation Korea. And, it's, uh, you know, when I had like five or six different titles, but it was kind of a play on words for me because, you know, sometimes you say destination such and such, you know, that type of thing. And But in some ways, now that Korea has uh, gained a lot of popularity you know, through pop culture and media outlets and stuff like that. And uh, the English teaching thing has gotten bigger and bigger. You know, for a lot of people now, they're, they're eyeballing Korea. Um, and in some ways, especially for a younger person, it is like a destiny in a way. You know, wow, I'm going to go to this place. I'm from the Midwest and I, I'm, I'm going to go to Korea. I can't believe it. You know, how do I get there and how do I do it? Because mm. um, I don't have exposure to... Uh, anyone with with knowledge about it other than someone on YouTube or something so over the years I would get questions and questions and uh, and eventually they just started becoming the same questions over and over so I said all right I'm gonna be leaving Korea the, at the time it was like about six or eight months out I said all right I'm gonna be leaving Korea um, uh, you know in about ten months <laughs> And I keep getting asked these questions, so you need to you need to just sit down because I've wanted to write a book for a while, yeah. and just lay it out and uh, collect your thoughts and collect all the five year, four and a half years of questions in your mind and what are the important ones mm -hmm. um, that you want to kind of highlight, and and that's what I put in into it. So it's really from the very beginning. I just looked at I just the same way that I approached making my channel, which was. Okay, when I wanted to teach English, there was Busan, Kevin, Durkee, there was uh, Steve, and Charlie Cheer, uh, the girl that 
Oh know, yeah, Charlie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Charlie, you I know what's Charlie. in my bag, and you know she was doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. So I said, wow, you know, there's. I want to put content out there and and help people give them some direction, and it just kept growing and growing, and more and more people were asking. So that's what drove that the project of writing the book, mm. and. Uh, it really just starts from the beginning. I just look, I just envisioned myself when I was looking. What are the questions that I had? And now that I've gone through it all for four and a half years, what can you really turn around and say to people, especially someone younger who hasn't moved around like I have? Maybe even within the states or from your home, I, you know, moving around place to place. Um, a lot of people have never left their hometown or even their parents' home, maybe you know, because they're still in college or something. Yeah. So it was that. It was from the point of really deciding uh, if it's for you and how to, and making that decision and then the whole process, get a job, get there, what to expect, how to process a lot of the shock and awe and uh, saving money and, you know, different, all the different things like that. So that was the whole purpose of it to hopefully, you know, put, put any knowledge or, um, assistance mm -hmm. that I could do into a book so that it's 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 out there and I wanted to do it while I was in Korea when it was all still fresh in my mind cool so I mean where, where can people find your book where can they buy it well uh, it's on Amazon but uh, it's also on Smashwords Barnes and Noble um, iTunes store uh, so it depends on whatever format you're looking for. Okay, it's, nice, nice, uh, nice. It's, it's all over the place. And yeah. I, I'm going to uh, ask Tom to send me those links, and I'll put those all in the show notes at justjapanstuff.com. So when you go to episode number 115, you'll see all the links to this book. So if you're interested in teaching in Korea, it's all there. Um, I'm curious, uh, Tom, so for those out there who are sitting in their parents' Uh, living room, you know, they're in college, they're still at their parents' house. And hey, I lived with my parents when I went to college. Yeah. Um, I, or as we would say in Canada, university. Yes, <laughs> here, same here. Same here. Very, very different, very different. I've noticed, it's one of those cultural things I've noticed over the years of of, of being abroad. I know that uh, most, most of my friends from America refer to any kind of post-secondary education as college. Mm. Whereas in, in Canada, it's very different. The university is a four-year degree program and college is a technical uh, to, usually a two-year technical program, right, right. and I've got both because uh, I did the degree in university, and then I went and got a college a college diploma in three D graphics. Um, when my when my degree my degree in arts didn't actually qualify me for any kind of job, um, uh. but yeah, but that's another story. That's another <laughs> podcast. Um, no, um, so for for those out there who are at home, um, you know, or they're 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 living in America, they're living in Canada, they're they're doing something that's not teaching related, but they have an interest in Korea or they have an interest in Japan, mm. and you know, they're like, wow, you know, I'd really love to move to Asia to teach English. Mm. Um, do you have any advice for those people? Things that they could do to me, you know, obviously there's a, every year there's a deluge of people throwing resumes towards English schools and universities and programs like Epic or Jet. Um, what, what do you think are some things people can do to kind of make themselves stand out? Well, the, the first thing I would say even before getting to the job hunting uh, part is the two biggest, the two biggest things is a lot of people ask kids that are in high school or college, I want, I want to teach, uh, what should I study? Should I study English? Should I study this and that? Here's what I would say. This is my personal opinion. You should not take a college course based on your desire to potentially teach ESL in Korea or Japan. Mm. If you want to be a teacher someday, whether it be in Korea or home or another country, then study education. But don't go out taking English or linguistics or ESL just because you want to go teach in Korea. Mm. Because you may never, even within a two or three year span, four year span in, in university, you, you'll change, you may just change your mind. And then you're like, why did I do that? You know, I, I'm not even going to Korea. Or you might go for one year and say, this was stupid, I hated it, or something like that. Yeah. So study what you want to study for the long haul because they don't really care for the vast majority of jobs. They just want to make sure you have a degree, a bachelor's degree. 
Yeah, and, and that's I, I completely 120% agree with you. Um, I worked in many different schools in Korea. You know, I've worked in Japan. And the degree is what qualifies you for the visa. Exactly. And if you have a degree from, an, like, you know, if you're a native English speaker with a degree, it could be in business, commerce, science, you know, English, um, Asian studies. Yeah. It doesn't matter. You're going to you're going to get that visa. Right. And that's really all it's about is getting it. The, the reason why they're harping on, um, you know, the degree is for the visa. So um, what most people not like yourself, you're a homeroom teacher. Yeah. Or, yeah. So I work at an international school. So in my case, you know, you actually have to have a teaching license, which mm. which actually, you know, you in, in that case at, you know, international schools, big international schools, you're going to have to have a teaching degree in your own country. Teaching experience in your own country, not not just like ESL teaching, but as a homeroom teacher, that's a very different thing, though. Very different. Um, yeah, yeah. But as an English, and I, I got the same emails. People are like, I want to be an ESL teacher. Or I want to teach English in Korea. Should I get an English degree? I say no, no, no. Just get a degree. Right. Study what you want to study. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know? I mean, to be honest, uh, in my later, like here I am. I'm 40 years old now. I'll be 41. In a in a in a few days. Oh my God! Congratulations. <laughs> Pardon? Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, to be honest, I mean, I have a I have a general arts degree, and communications and English, um, and then I later went on to get technical stuff, and then I went to get my teaching degree. But if if I could all, I mean, for all of you guys out there who know me, you follow my Instagram, you follow all this and that. If I could go back and study entomology or ornithology, I'm a I, I love. I love photographing birds and bugs and reading about bugs and studying bugs. Mm. Like it's, it's, it's become a passion. Um, I wish I could be a scientist, but right, you know, right. so we all have different things we go through, but, but at the end of the day to be a teacher of English, right. You know, you just need to have that higher education to get the visa and right. hopefully a good grasp of your own language. Mm. Um, yeah, because you know the nature of of most of the jobs is just speaking and um, modeling authentic speech. I mean, that's yeah. the gist of it. So, yeah. you know, until you get past that massive layer to get to the international school homeroom jobs, private schools, high university stuff like that, you know, most people are content with doing the doing the the big gist of jobs and just kind of traveling or doing what they do. Um, yeah. So that's why I would say study something that you're going to fall back on because you're going to change your mind many times in life anyway. And so, well, I mean, most people, I mean, you've, you've been around the block a few times as in mm. you, you've been in, you've been in Asia now for uh, five, six plus years. Mm. And um, you know, the turnover rates pretty, pretty steady. Mm -hmm. I mean, I find that I mean, and maybe times have changed. I, I'm, I'm assuming times have changed in Korea, but I was in Korea from 2002 to 2000 and early <laughs> 2007. Uh, and I found that your typical ESL teacher would say for one year. Yeah. And I remember they were like, there was a almost like a derogatory term because I'd been there I, at one point when I'd been there for three years, they're like, you're a lifer, lifer. Right, right. I was like, I've, I've been here for three years. Right. Um, but when I meet people in Japan, people in Japan, I've you know I've met people who've been here for years and years and years. Um, but but then you, I, I still work with people who come for one year and they go. They come for two years and they go. Um, you know, it, it's yeah. a pretty transient thing. I mean, people come, they're like, I've had a wonderful experience, but now it's time to move on to a new experience. Right, right. You know, and I think I th think much of that has to do with I think my second point, which is this. If a person, for anybody really, any, of any age, they're sitting at home, I would say to you this. What is in your mind right now of what you think Kevin and I are doing or what teaching abroad is, is not what it is. Okay. It's, it's going to be completely different when you get here. You know, I mean, you're, most people are watching YouTube videos. Most people are watching uh, K-pop videos or j-pop videos mm -hmm. and they're like oh how awesome and romantic that would be and da, 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 da. but it's not quite that way it's <laughs> it's very different you know it's life you're going to be living life doing what you're doing 
now in a way, you know, your, your job and going to grocery stores and going to the dentist and, you know, this and that, but you're going to be doing it in another, in another country, which is interesting. But, um, what happens is I think people, some of them think it's going to be this amazing adventure, this like roller coaster ride the entire time. Yeah. Yeah. And, but what they don't see is they don't see, look, Every shade of gray of type of person and cast and character that is back home is generally and generally speaking is in Korea, is in Japan. Mm. The good, the bad, the ugly. Um, so that's what it's really going to be like. And you can make it awesome and you can go away with amazing experiences and stuff like that. But that requires mental discipline. And so just you need to prepare yourself for that and not get too attached to what you might think it is. Um, exactly. It's yeah. it's a very different experience for everyone. And I mean, a lot of people ask me, um, okay, so for example, in Korea, I had, you know, I went to Korea a single guy in my mid-20s. Mm. And I had some adventures. Yeah. <laughs> I had some great times. I partied sometimes way too much. <laughs> I traveled all around Southeast Asia, backpacking, kind of this and that in the holidays. I, w- I would do the whole, like, I'd work a contract, save up a bunch of money, get my, because I was working at Hogwans. When I first came to Korea, like, there was no epic. It was unheard of. Like, people did not teach in public schools. They're, they're, like, just, they're, it didn't, it didn't happen. Mm. There was no one. <laughs> there was no mm. program. It just, there was nothing. Like, uh, um, basically, if you're a foreigner, you were teaching in, in a Hogwan. Mm. And um, it was really Wild West when I first got there. I mean, there was like, in theory, you're supposed to have a degree, but there was like tons of like hogwans that would send people to Thailand to go on road to get like fake degrees and stuff and come back oh, with the fake degrees. Like, and I even met people who were like, my hogwan sent me to Thailand to get a fake degree. Really? From the University of Toronto <laughs> in English. And they would go and you could go to Koh San Road in, in Thailand in Bangkok, and you could say, I'm a Canadian, and I want a university degree from the University of Toronto, a Bachelor of Arts degree, and I need transcripts, and they would make these for you. Wow. And, like, and I knew guys who were, had like, I've been teaching for years in Korea this way. And it was like, oh, my God, wow. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, yeah, it was really crazy. Um, that was, like, 2002, and, and then, and like, midway through that year, they started snapping down on those people. Mm. And all of a sudden, like, all kinds of people I knew were getting deported <laughs> um, because they didn't have degrees. And, like, the, the, the uh, immigration people were, were catching on to it. Um, but, I mean, you know, I had my adventures. But now, for example, my time in, in, in Japan, um, I came to Japan because I met a Japanese woman in Busan. That's so funny. I know, huh? That's Who so would have thunk it, right? And then, and then we moved <laughs> to Canada. And then we moved to Japan. So, I mean, I came here a married man. And then I, you know, I have a family. So people like, you know, I can remember over the when I, I don't get these messages anymore. But when I first arrived here, people were like, you know, what's a nightclub life in Japan? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I still don't okay. know. I've actually, I've actually never been in a Japanese nightclub. I've been here for eight years. I've never been in one. Wow. Yeah, uh, and I'm okay with that. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm perfectly okay with that. P- people are like, what's what's dating like in Japan? I'm like, well, my friends tell me, blah blah yeah. blah blah. Yeah. My coworkers tell me, blah, 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 blah. But myself, I have no idea. Right. And they'll look, but your wife's Japanese. I'm like, yeah. But I met her in another country, and she's the only Japanese person I've ever dated. That's so funny. <laughs> yeah, so I have no experience. Um, you know, I could talk a lot about family stuff and education, having kids in education. Well, you know, but um, but th- that's the wonderful thing about all of our experiences on YouTube and in here and there. We all have such different ones. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, Tom, I'm curious. I don't want to keep you up much later. It, you know, we've been talking for all this. We've been having a great talk. Um, mm-hmm. And, of course, everyone out there listening, everything we've talked about tonight will be at JustJapanStuff.com under episode 115, Red Dragon Diaries. But um, for those of – I mean, everyone's curious. How can how can people find you uh, online? How can they find your social media stuff, mm-hmm. where you are, your YouTube, all that stuff? Can you throw all the links out at us? Yeah, the, you know, I guess the best uh, for YouTube, it's Red Dragon Diaries, um, which you can also type in Soul T, which was my, which is still my original uh, screen name for Red Dragon Diaries. Yeah, but I, I've discovered like when you when you type in Red Dragon Diaries, just boom, there you are. I think that's the easiest way. That's, that's 
You're the top search. You're the top yeah, hit. Yeah. Yep. Red Dragon Diaries for YouTube and also for my website or um, blog is Red Dragon Diaries. Uh, you can find actually you can find job listings on my site now and my book is there as well. Cool. Uh, and then Facebook is uh, Facebook Soul T, but you could probably also type Red Dragon Diaries. It'll probably come up. Cool, cool, cool. How about Twitter? Twitter. Do you, do you, you don't use it so much, do you? I really, I, I really don't even use it. Okay. I, I know I. That's should. how I've been contacting you, but I mean, yeah, yeah. I really should. I should have done that a long time ago, but I just never got into it for some reason. Yeah. My I, I have to admit, I mean, I, I'm someone who uh, finds my Facebook ecosystem the best, like the Just Japan Podcast Facebook page, which is actually a Busan Kevin page. But I, I say Just Japan Podcast because that's the relevance now. Mm. Um, that's where I play. That's my ecosystem. I love yeah. hanging out with all, all the people on the Just Japan Podcast Facebook page. Twitter, I'm like, eh, I post stuff there. Right, right. Yeah, but I don't have much interaction there. I just yeah. post stuff there. Yeah, same here, same here. I'm mostly just Facebook is the best place for me. Uh, totally, totally, totally. Well, cool. Uh, well, Tom, thank you so much for doing this uh, tonight. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Yeah, it was good to finally actually talk to you. I know we've sent messages and whatnot through videos, but uh, it was good to talk to you finally after yeah. all these years. It was really cool. So thank you so much. And everyone, yep. go over and uh, check out his stuff and like his stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, like and share. Like and share. Share, share, share. Yeah. All right. All right, guys. I want to thank Tom for taking the time to stop by the Just Japan podcast and chat about his experiences in Korea, his experiences in Japan, his time learning about judo, training in judo, and to talk about his YouTube channel. So, of course, um, all the links to Tom, to get hold of Tom, to contact him, to find out all his stuff online will be in the show notes at JustJapanStuff.com, as well as a lot of the videos we talked about tonight. So it's a one-stop shop. You go there, you check out, you can find all the videos, you can find out all the links to Tom, to all the things I talk about. Go check it out. All right, guys, remember, uh, summer's here. It's time to make sure you consume lots of water, sports, drinks, or juice. Uh, beware of heat stroke. It's happening a lot. If you're in Japan, um, you know, you know, be careful because the humidity is insane. Take care of yourself and make sure you're drinking a lot. If you're traveling to Japan this summer, really take care of yourselves. Um, try to get into air conditioning when you can. And really be aware of drinking, consuming a lot of liquids. I recommend sports drinks like Aquarius, Bacari Sweat, Amino Value if you can find it. <clears throat> That's probably your best one, but it's kind of hard to come by. Um, yeah, those things are great. Um, you know, keep yourself hydrated. Be safe. Uh, keep your head covered up. The sun is very intense here in Japan. Um, yeah, so, of course, you can find the Just Japan podcast on iTunes, on Stitcher Internet Radio, on SoundCloud, on Libsyn. We're all over the place. All the show notes are at JustJapanStuff.com. There's stuff all over the place there. Uh, remember the, uh, like I mentioned earlier on in the episode, the the Just Japan stuff uh, Patreon campaign has been reinvigorated. There's incentives now. Uh, there weren't incentives before. Uh, you can get yourself mentioned in the episodes. You can get like bonus material, bonus podcasts. Um, you know, you can pimp your stuff on the podcast if you want to, depending on what it is, if it fits, um, and maybe even get yourself interviewed if you'd like. Check out uh, that at patreon.com slash uh, podcast. The link will be in the show notes, of course, as well. It helps a lot. If you guys like the podcast, you, you know, you think, you think this brings happiness to you, you can help out. Um, yeah, so there you go. Um, but you can also always help out just by sharing the podcast. Um, share this podcast on Twitter, on your Facebook, on your um, whatever you may be using. I'd say Google Plus, but <laughs> um, yeah, but share the podcast and help spread the word about the Just Japan podcast. I definitely appreciate it. Um, and just a reminder, if you go to JustJapanStuff.com, it's not always just podcast stuff there. I, I'm i going to try to write some more stuff there and put some other like uh you know, blog posts about life in Japan, nature, Japan, all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. Also, check out my wildlife photography, guys. I love taking pictures of nature, of insects, of birds, and all that stuff. It's over on Facebook, facebook.com slash birds of Kansai, birds of Kansai. Um, also, of course, if you want to see what Japan looks like, go check out my YouTube channels. 
uh, youtube.com slash Busan Kevin, because I used to live in Busan, South Korea, many years ago. And uh, youtube.com slash Kev. So there you go, guys. That's it for another week of the Just Japan podcast. I hope you enjoyed listening to me talking to Tom from the Red Dragon Diaries. I know I certainly enjoyed the conversation. I was excited about it, and I was really happy to learn a lot of cool things. Um, yeah, but that's it. So stay tuned. Next week, we'll be back right at you with a new episode, another cool topic about Japan. So until then, hope you're happy, hope you're healthy, and I'll be talking to you very soon. Mm-hmm.